Well, thank you for joining us. It's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's Center for Public Law lecture. Tonight's lecture series is named in honor of Sir David Williams, and we're delighted to have members of his family here this evening. Sir David was a highly distinguished legal scholar. He produced landmark works on official secrets, public order, civil liberties, and public law, and how wonderful it would have been to have had his take on the Police Crime Sentencing and the Courts Act and the Public Order Bill. In addition, though, to his scholarly work, he was president of Wolfson College and vice chancellor of the university. He was the first vice chancellor in 800 years to hold the post full time. His enduring reputation is not only for his many scholarly endeavors and achievements, but for the spirit that he brought in fostering communities and places of excellence. It's in this vein that this lecture series was generously founded by John Nolan and Mike Russ. The first lecture was given in 2001 by Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female associate justice of the US Supreme Court. Since then, lectures have been given by the Honorable Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Dame Sean Elias, Chief Justice of New Zealand, Professor Cheryl Saunders, the Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin, Chief Justice of Canada, Lady Brenda Hale, President of the UK Supreme Court, and of course, a few men. <laughs> Tonight's speaker is Professor Kate O'Regan. Professor O'Regan is the inaugural director of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights and a former judge of the South African Constitutional Court. In the 1980s, she practiced as a lawyer in Johannesburg in a variety of fields, but especially labor law and land law, representing many of the emerging trade unions and their members, as well as communities threatened with eviction under apartheid. In 1990, she joined the Faculty of Law at the University of Cape Town, where she taught a range of courses, including race, gender, and the law, labor law, civil procedure, and evidence. Since her 15-year term at the South African Constitutional Court ended, she has, among other things, served as an ad hoc judge of the Supreme Court, chaired an inquiry into the breakdown of trust between police and the community, and acted as a member of boards of many non-governmental organizations working in the fields of democracy, rule of law, human rights, and equality. It is, therefore, with the greatest pleasure that I welcome Professor O'Regan to share with us her vision on crafting the Constitution. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for that warm welcome, Kirsty, and thanks to everybody here um, in the Cambridge Law Faculty and the Public Law Centre. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure, Lady Williams, that you're here. I, I didn't know Sir, Sir David, but I have read a lot about him over the last little while, and members of your family as well. So it's a great honour for me to have been asked to deliver this lecture in honour of Sir David Williams. I almost feel I have come to know him from reading the tributes that the constellation of judges, scholars, and practitioners who've delivered this lecture before me have given. It's clear that he was a brilliant thinker, inventive, engaged, and engaging, but he was also a doer, someone who was willing to lead institutions, and in that he appears to have been a great motivator of people, not always a common talent. And finally, he was clearly a mensch, kind and interested in everybody he met. When he delivered this lecture, my former colleague, the former Chief Justice of South Africa, Arthur Chaskelson, told the story about when he had gone to New Zealand um, to a large gathering of judges in honor of Sir Robin Cook's retirement, when Arthur, who is, was quite a quiet and meticulous and tidy human being, managed with some wild gesture to knock over an entire bottle of New Zealand red wine onto a white carpet. Knowing Arthur, I'm sure he felt completely mortified. He went on to say that he felt even more alarmed when Sir David stepped forward and said, I know what to do, and took a bottle of white wine and poured it straight over the spreading stain. <laughs> Arthur thought, oh my gosh. Anyway, in fact, according to Arthur, 
the, the, uh, the stain disappeared. And in fact, I've seen Arthur advise exactly the same thing at an occasion in South Africa and tell the story. So I also read Brenda Hale's story about how when she was at Manchester, she warmly welcomed Sir David and his family, I think, to her home for an occasion. And sometime during the dinner, Sir David went missing. So she thought she'd better go looking for him, this distinguished visitor from Cambridge, and she found him sitting on the stairs chatting to her two-year-old. <laughs> These tales are told with great warmth and affection. And for all of you who knew Sir David, I imagine the memorial lecture is a bittersweet occasion, as one never stops missing dear colleagues, friends, and family members who have left us. I feel a little the same about Arthur Chaskelson, who died not very long ago and who was such a dear colleague. And I can still conjure his presence very often when I, when I read his writing. So as I've said, this lecture has been delivered by an extraordinarily array of gifted members of all three branches of the legal profession. Kirsty's mentioned some of them already, and I'll, I'll add a few men in just so that they don't think we're not going to acknowledge the men. <laughs> Judges who have delivered the lecture include Lord Bingham, Lady Hale, Sir Stephen Sedley, and Sir Rabinda Singh, as well as, of course, Arthur Chaskelson, Sean Elias, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Beverly McLaughlin. Practitioners have included my former colleague from South Africa as well, Sir Sidney Kentridge, and Michael Beloff, and scholars have included Ronald Dworkin, Jeremy Waldron, and Connor Geerty. These are rather intimidating antecedents, as indeed many of those who have delivered their lecture have said in their introductory remarks. Yet their diversity across the three forms of our profession is also relevant to the remarks I'm going to make today, as I hope will become clear. In the last 75 years, and especially in the last 30 years, written constitutions, and in some cases constitutional legislation, have conferred a range of sweeping powers on courts. More than 160 constitutions now confer the power to declare legislation to be invalid if it is in breach of fundamental rights protected in a constitution or if it has not been enacted in accordance with constitutional procedures. Many commentators criticize this trend, especially in the Anglo-American democracies. Perhaps this is not surprising because it, in the Anglo-American world at least, the paradigmatic example of such courts remains the United States Supreme Court. The political contestation that swirls around that court, both in regard to appointments to it and in relation to its decisions, particularly in the last year, makes many conclude that the empowerment of courts is politically unwise and indeed some consider it downright harmful. Jonathan Sumption's Wreath Lectures are an example of precisely that approach. More recently, Martin Lachlan, in his book Against Constitutionalism, suggests that constitutionalism, which he defines as a system of governance based on a written constitution enforced by courts and which gives expression to the polity's identity, is a pernicious ideology that undermines democracy by focusing attention on the courts rather than on the political arms of government and which often enables wealthy elites to pursue their own material interests. To me, these criticisms, formulated as they are, as general and abstract claims, are not fully convincing. Not because courts always play a benign role in any constitutional setting, but because what role they do play requires detailed and careful investigation in each setting and varies across jurisdictions and over time. If asked, I might suggest that the branch of government that presents the greatest threat to democracies around the, the world in the modern era, and perhaps in other eras too, is the executive. Across the world, we are seeing that the executive branch act in a self-aggrandizing manner, which often threatens the rule of law, democracy, and the protection of human rights. And indeed, the first step of the authoritarian executive often involves curtailing the power of courts, which suggests that the executive see courts as imposing institutional limits on executive power. But the focus of this lecture is firmly on the courts. Instead of asking whether it is a good idea to give courts an expanded role in governance, something I think it's difficult to argue for at a very general level, I'm going to consider one of the factors that may enable courts to perform the functions that are conferred upon them 
in a satisfactory manner. There are many factors, of course, that will determine this, including the constitutional text, the design and jurisdiction of the court, its relationship with the other arms of government and the body politic more generally, as well as with other institutions, notably the legal profession and the media, the manner in which courts function and give reasons, and the history of the court's role in that body politic. In assessing how a court performs its constitutional mandate, all these factors cons deserve consideration. Today, however, I'm only going to consider one of them, which I shall call the craft of constitutional adjudication. I'll suggest that key to understanding how a court adjudicates the cases that come before it requires an understanding of whether the court operates in terms of a professional craft of adjudication. Developing and maintaining a craft of adjudication is not easy for courts, particularly at times of fundamental constitutional change. That craft may be challenged and contested. In the lecture, I'll begin by giving examples of the expanding role of courts then turn to explain what I mean by the craft of adjudication and the core elements of it. And finally, I will provide an illustration by considering the development of a craft of adjudication in South Africa in the transition from apartheid to democracy. So turning to the expanding role of courts. The expanding role of courts under the written constitutions of the last 30 years was perhaps surprisingly not something that most political scientists either predicted or proposed. Constitutional democracy, as Samuel Isakharov has explained, is a system of constrained, constrained democracy which embodies antagonistic impulses. On the one hand, democracy vests decision-making in majorities, whereas constitutionalism removes from immediate popular control certain significant realms of politics. And there's an array of ways in which constitutionalism may remove matters from the purview of the majority. First, as Albert Venn Dicey observed over a century ago, in federal systems where there's a division of power between a central government and regional or state governments, an institution is required to determine conflicts that arise and the role, that role is generally played by courts. Dicey thought that the consequence was that federalism means legalism, the predominance of the judiciary in the Constitution, the prevalence of a spirit of legality among the people. Many of the world's larger countries are federal in some respect. Think of the United States, Australia, Nigeria, Brazil, Germany. Federations, of course, vary in how they're designed and how they work. But with only a few exceptions, including Switzerland and Ethiopia, Courts in federal systems play a key role in determining conflicts that arise about the allocation of powers. Federal regional conflicts are often intensely politically salient, and courts have to navigate an appropriate role in the body politic in seeking to adjudicate the disputes that arise. Secondly, courts have in many constitutions been given the power to determine the constitutionality of legislation. There are two forms of constitutional review of legislation. The first requires courts to consider whether the legislation under challenge has been passed following constitutionally mandated procedures. The second raises the question whether the legislation itself is consistent with the fundamental rights in the Constitution. The power to find legislation to be inconsistent with the Constitution is referred to by Americans generally as the power of judicial review, but I'm going to use the phrase constitutional review to distinguish it from the judicial review of administrative action. Thirdly, courts have been given a role in protecting democracy. This role can take many different forms. In Germany, for example, at the time of the drafting of the Germany con German constitution in the aftermath of the Second World War, because the Nazis had risen to power within the provisions of the Weimar Republic constitution, close attention was paid to seeking to prevent something similar from happening, happening again. The techniques used to achieve this goal have been used in other places too and are now often referred to as principles of militant democracy. Militant democracy includes a range of tools, including prohibitions on extremist, anti-democratic parties' participation in electoral processes, the exclusion of certain individuals from eligibility for standing from public, for public office, 
as well as restrictions on certain forms of speech. And these rules are often enforced by courts. Fourthly, courts have sometimes been given important roles in relation to constitution making itself. One of the most well-known examples of this is the role conferred upon the South African Constitutional Court to determine whether a constitutional text adopted by the elected Constitutional Assembly was consistent with a set of constitutional principles that had been agreed before the first democratic elections by the key political actors in the process of transition from apartheid to democracy. This two-stage approach has been followed in several other countries since. And finally, courts in constitutional frameworks founded on the rule of law will generally have a broad jurisdiction to determine whether the provisions of the constitution or constitutional legislation have been lawfully implemented. The consequence is that constitutional frameworks, whether intentionally or not, often confer new roles on courts. One could include within this category, for example, the first Miller decision, probably the second as well, where the UK courts held that the British government, that is the executive arm of government, did not have the power to initiate the UK's withdrawal from the EU under Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union without an Act of Parliament authorising it to do so. Of course, an Act of Parliament, the European Union Notification of Withdrawal Act of 2017, authorising the executive to trigger Article 50, was passed just two days after the Supreme Court handed down its decision in January 2017. So these five categories I've listed illustrate the array of powers that have been conferred upon courts in different constitutional settings. I'm now going to turn to explore the idea of craft, the craft of constitutional, of constitutional adjudication. But I should conclude before I do so in relation to these array of powers that these powers are often conferred upon courts at times of fundamental constitution, constitutional change. They're often challenging times politically perilous, and courts are given these roles to seek to stabilize or legitimate a new constitutional dispensation, and nearly always by political actors. So turning then to the craft of constitutional adjudication, I'm not the first to refer to adjudication as a craft. Carl Llewellyn, the distinguished American law professor, whose writing veers more quickly than any other scholar I know between the brilliant and the baffling, wrote a chapter in his book, The Common Law Tradition, Deciding Appeals, which analyzed how American appellate courts decide cases, and the chapter was entitled, Appellate Judging as a Craft of Law. Llewellyn defined craft as a significant body of working know-how that is transmitted to the incomer, which elicits ideals, pride, and responsibility in the craftsman, and which has much more to, do to it than rules can describe. In writing this book, Llewellyn was responding to what he considered to be a crisis of confidence amongst practicing lawyers in the United States that appellate decision-making had become arbitrary and unpredictable. He disputed that appellate decision-making was arbitrary and, and unpredictable, and in one of his trademark baffling terms, said that adjudication was reasonably reckonable, by which I think he meant predictable or knowable. He acknowledged that appellate cases are tough cases, and indeed they are, as they ordinarily come before courts when lawyers on both sides advise that there are prospects of success on appeal. Even in these challenging circumstances, Llewellyn claimed that U.S. state court appellate division decisions were sufficient for skilled craftsmen to make usable and valuable judgments about likelihoods and sufficient, too, to render the handling of an appeal a fitting subject for effective and satisfying craftsmanship. Llewellyn's use of the term craft was not enthusiastically received by scholars. His legal biographer, William Twining, considered it to be old-fashioned, even quaint, embarrassing, awkward. And the Japanese scholar, Harakawa, criticized it as a nostalgic approach to a kind of tradition-bound cottage industry at a time when legal practice is moving into an era of mass production. And perhaps when encountered in the 21st century, the word craft does have a distinctively William Morris air. Yet I would argue that the word craft captures two important elements of how judges adjudicate. 
It captures the idea of individual effort and skill as being core to the task of judging. And secondly, it captures the transgenerational professional community of which the individual forms part when judging. As William Twining also observed, it revealingly links the importance of tradition and the idea of the craftsman who is both an individual and yet who is formed by and is part of a communal enterprise. A core element of judicial craft, and perhaps the one that we see most clearly, lies in the style of judging. Llewellyn distinguished two styles of judging in the United States. The first, again using one of his perplexing phrases, he called the grand style of judging, which he said promoted reckonability, that is, reasonable predictability, and the second he called the formal style, which he disdained. The formal style was closely associated with the deeply embedded scholarly tradition in the United States in the 1920s, which, in fact, from about the 1880s onwards, which he, which he disdained. And it said that law is a science and quite separate from politics. Opposition to the formal style was one of the unifying objects of American realists, a rather diverse group of scholars, of whom Llewellyn was one of the leading voices. In the common law tradition, Llewellyn maintained that judges were reverting to the grand style of legal reasoning, and that in his view, this style of appellate reasoning, together with other key elements of the appellate system, would diminish the crisis of confidence in the courts. Twining identifies three key distinctions between the grand style and formalism, and they have some relevance even today. The grand style looks at the reason or principle behind a rule, whereas the formal style tends to look at the text or the words of the rule itself. The grand style investigates the social context and background to a case, which the formal style considers to be extraneous to the judicial task. And the grand style attends to the way in which rules develop through the jurisprudence and seeks to provide guidance for future cases Again, something the formal style tends to eschew. The treatment of style is an example of Llewellyn's flair for drawing attention to what Twining calls the neglected obvious. Llewellyn defined an adjudicative style as the general and pervasive manner over the country at large at any given time of going about the job, the general outlook, the ways of professional know-how, the kind of things the men of law are sensitive to and strive for, the tone and flavour of the working and of the results. It corresponds to what we think of as period style in architecture or the graphic arts or furniture or music or drama. In my view, Llewellyn's treatment of appellate decision-making contains some striking inter insights into how we should think about the practice of adjudication, both in our own legal systems and across different legal systems, and is illuminating too when we think about the expanded role of courts. I shall mention three. First, his argument starts from the premise that in a legal system, practitioners, and I would add the broader legal community, including legal scholars, should have confidence that an appellate court's decisions will be reasonably predictable, or in Llewellyn's word, reckonable, based on the use of recognized legal techniques and reasoning, and not merely expressions of arbitrary political preference. Like others in the American Realist School, Llewellyn does not assert that all legal questions inevitably have one right answer. But he nevertheless asserts that appellate decision-making should be sufficiently predictable to enable skilled lawyers to give advice about likelihoods and to be able to identify and prepare arguments that will be likely to persuade an appellate court. And he says that this is a core aspect of a functioning legal system. He notes that legal practitioners are engaged in the craft of lawyering themselves, and competent appellate decision-making should enable them to consider the argument of an appeal to enable them to engage in effective and satisfying craftsmanship, in his words. One of the questions, then, in relation to the expanded role of courts in any specific legal system is whether that expanded role enables lawyers to provide advice about likelihoods and identify and prepare good legal argument. There is something of deep intuitive importance here. Lawyers who argue before appellate courts are in a well-functioning system, professionally skilled craftspeople, if you will, 
who labor long and hard over the arguments that they present to courts. They follow closely the arguments of their opponents and generally have a firm sense as to which of those arguments are plausible or indeed legally stronger than their own. If a court decides a case in a manner which does not fit with those lawyers' expectations of what a court can plausibly decide in the case, the court's reputation will be harmed, but so will the confidence of the legal profession in the project of adjudication and in lawyering as a craft. The second insight, central to Llewellyn's account, is the shifts that he describes in the style of appellate reasoning in the United States. He contrasts the grand style of which he approves with the formalist style which he disparages. It is clear from Llewellyn's account and those of other scholars of the time that there was intense contestation within the legal profession in the United States at the time as which these adjudicative style, as to which of these adjudicative styles was doctrinally and normatively superior. It infected the academy very deeply. His book, therefore, draws our attention to the contingent and mutable character of legal reasoning, how contested, sk- shift, sorry, how contested shifts from one form of reasoning to another may be, and how those shifts may affect confidence in the courts. A third point that can be drawn from Llewellyn's account is the interconnectedness of the work that practitioners, legal scholars, and judges do. Practicing lawyers, legal academics, and judges are all engaged in some capacity with the craft of lawyering. Legal scholars, amongst other things, engage in the analysis and critique, particularly of the work of judges. It is arguable that a well-functioning legal system requires, in addition to the lawyers who argue cases and the judges who decide them, the quality control that a competent and engaged legal academy brings to its craft. Where the style of constitutional reasonings changes, the relationship both within and between these different branches of the profession may be unsettled or disrupted. While some judges may be in the vanguard of change in adjudicative style, others may resist it. And similarly, both in legal practice and the academy, there may be, may be contest, contestation around these shifts. The insights drawn here from Llewellyn's work are thus interconnected. The first tells us that for the legal profession to have confidence in the courts, the legal profession considers that it needs to be able to predict the likelihood of the outcome of cases, which should be based on recognized modes of legal reasoning and argument about legal doctrine, and not on political preference. Secondly, it's clear from Llewellyn's work that styles of constitutional adjudication and what courts Um, what counts as legitimate and convincing forms of legal argument may well change over time, sometimes markedly. Like all fundamental changes in social practice, these changes are likely to be disruptive and contested. And thirdly, given the close connections between the craft of legal practice and the craft of constitutional adjudication, it may well be, as it was in Llewellyn's time, that fundamental changes in adjudicative style will unsettle at least some practitioners, academics, and even judges, and may lead to a crisis of confidence. I shall return to these insights in a moment. So turning to contemporary styles of constitutional adjudication, comparative public lawyers have begun to develop an interest in comparing the different styles of judicial reasoning in constitutional cases, much as Llewellyn did in the 1950s. A recent major study examined the style of constitutional reasoning defined as the public reasons judges give for their decisions in 18 disparate jurisdictions. The study analyzed and compared the argumentation patterns in 40 leading judgments in each of the jurisdictions, distinguishing between different types of argumentation, three key ones being chain-like argumentation, where a conclusion is supported by one line of argument, Parallel argumentation, where conclusions are supported by several arguments, each of which on its own might lead to the conclusion. And what the study calls dialogic reasoning, where a conclusion rests on several lines of argument, none of which may on its own be conclusive. The study also looked at the repertoire of interpretive tools in use in each jurisdiction, the use of foreign precedent, for example, the reliance on key constitutional concepts such as democracy, the rule of law, liberty, equality, and dignity. It's a fascinating study. 
there are two aspects of it that are relevant to my talk this evening. The first is unsurprising. The study found sharp differences between the legal systems. Take the United Kingdom and France, for example. The French Conseil <coughs> Constitutionnel adopts a formal mode of syllogistic reasoning. Its decisions are constructed as a single sentence, each with a major and minor premise and a conclusion. It is arguably the archetypal form of chain-like reasoning. The Conseil does not use forms of analogical reasoning or cite scholarly works. Indeed, it rarely cites its own decisions, and dissenting, dissenting opinions are not permitted. Unlike the French Conseil in the UK Supreme Court, it is not uncommon for all the judges who participated in a decision to provide separate reasons for their conclusions. In the 40 judgments under review in the study, there could have been a total of 216 written opinions if every judge had written in every case. There were, as it happens, 188, far more than the 40 decisions that the Conseil produced. <coughs> and like the Conseil as well, the UK Supreme Court relies heavily on precedent, on the jurisprudence of other courts. In only six of the 40 cases was there no reference to jurisprudence of another jurisdiction. And perhaps a little more surprisingly, it also relies heavily on scholarly works. In only four of the 40 decisions was there no reference to a scholarly work. We knew of these differences, of course, but the study illuminates them with empirical detail that reminds us how differently the craft of adjudication is performed across the world. Secondly, the study makes clear that adjudicative styles change over time. These mutations may at least sometimes be associated with the changing function of courts in a constitutional setting, although this question is not investigated in the study. Nearly every system shows signs of change over time. There are even small signs of change in the French mode of constitutional reasoning. One example is that the length of the decisions have slowly grown over the last few decades. With regard to the United Kingdom, and again you will know this, the study records the changing role of courts in the United Kingdom constitution since the Second World War, noting that before the 1960s, the proportion of the court's docket that concerned constitutional cases was relatively small. In 1953, for example, the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords heard only 19 cases, half of which concerned tax law. Since the 1960s, of course, the role of the courts in relation to the unwritten constitution has changed significantly. That change has been triggered in part by the expanding principles of the judicial review of administrative action. An important harbinger of this change was Ridge v. Baldwin, reported in 1964, which extended the principles of natural justice to administrative review. Other factors that have led to the expanding role of courts here include, of course, the entry into what was then the European Economic Community with the passing of the European Communities Act in 1972, and indeed, the withdrawal from the European Union in the last few years. The enactment of the Human Rights Act in 1998, which incorporated the European Convention of Human Rights into domestic law in the UK, and importantly, the three devolution acts, the Scotland Act of 1998, the Government of Wales Act of 1998, and the Northern Ireland Act of 1998. These changes have significantly increased the volume of constitutional litigation before the UK Supreme Court and raised its public profile. Over the same period, the study asserts that there's been a shift in the style of legal reasoning, from a more formal style to a more purposive one. In some senses, this echoes Llewellyn's distinction between his rather unfortunately phrased the grand style and the formal style. A leading example of this change could be said to be the decision in Pepper v. Hart, in which the House of Lords ruled that it was permissible for courts when interpreting legislation to have regard to the legislative history, including Hansard. You will recall that one of the elements of the grand style was the idea that social and political context was relevant to adjudication. In supporting this change of approach, Lord Griffiths noted that the time has long passed when the courts adopted a strict constructionist view of interpretation, which requires them to adopt the literal meaning of the language. The courts now adopt a purposive approach which seeks to give effect to the true purpose of the legislation. What the study does not examine in relation to the UK or any of the other jurisdictions studied, as it was beyond its purview, is how contested changes in legal reasoning have been, both within a judiciary and between the judiciary and other actors in the broader poli body politics. 
Given the deep cultural character of adjudicative craft and styles of reasoning, I would suggest that where styles of constitutional adjudication change, it is likely often to be accompanied by contestation, as Llewellyn's study illustrates that it was in the United States. It's worth remembering that Llewellyn considered judicial style and craft to be a steadying factor in a legal system, one that enhanced the ability of the system to be, in his word, reckonable. Changes in it, which will inevitably take place over time and in an uneven manner, are likely to give rise to at least some level of contestation in the broader legal community and may reduce the stabilising effect of a shared commitment to a particular craft or style of reasoning. It may well be arguable that some of the discourse in the public discord in the public law community in the United Kingdom is not only about the proper role of courts in the constitutional framework, which it seems to be at least on its face, but also about the proper style of judicial reasoning. Now, I should like to turn to the last part of my rep- remarks and talk a little bit about the craft of constitutional adjudication in South Africa. In late October 1994, the newly appointed members of South Africa's Constitutional Court met for the first time. It was six months since the first democratic elections had taken place on the 27th of April, which had led both to the inauguration of Nelson Mandela as South Africa's first democratically elected president and to the convening of the first democratically elected parliament. In some ways, it was a strange time to confer substantial powers on the judiciary, And yet it's important to remember, as Andre Urdendahl's recent book, Dear Comrade President, that indeed this was very much what the African National Congress had wanted. This was not part of a compromise uh, in the negotiations that had taken place. But it was surprising because, after all, it was a new and hard-won democracy. And apart from the newly established constitutional court, the judges and magistrates who had been responsible for implementing the policy of apartheid remained on the bench and became responsible for implementing the newly adopted constitution. Before the 11 members of the constitutional court were appointed, there had been about 150 judges of the higher courts, of whom all but a handful were white men. The newly appointed constitutional court was by that standard notably diverse. Of its 11 members, seven were white, four were black, and nine were male, and two were female. In contemporary South Africa, that sounds laughably not diverse, but then it did seem very diverse. It was to be a very powerful court. Not only would it have the power to declare legislation invalid, but would have a final say as to whether the constitutional text to be drafted by the newly elected parliament, sitting as a constitutional assembly, complied with a set of constitutional principles that had been negotiated between the liberation movements and the apartheid government before the democratic elections were held. It was, however, the final court of appeal in constitution matters only, and the appellate division, which had been established at the time of union in 1910, remained the highest court of appeal in other matters. A footnote to history is that since 2013, the constitutional court is now the final court of appeal in all matters. One of the distinctive features of the apartheid regime had been its use of law. Every person was by law allocated a racial classification at birth, and that classification determined that person's life opportunities, where they could live, go to school, to university, work, who they could marry, which hospital they could go to, and which beach. All were determined by apartheid laws and regulations based on racial classification. All the judges appointed to the Constitutional Court had trained as lawyers during apartheid, and most had spent their careers seeking to assist clients who were opposing the apartheid state or were deeply disadvantaged by it. During the apartheid era, there was a lively debate among South African scholars, led by, amongst others, John Dugard and David Dysonhaus, as to why judges had been willing to provide such an effective underpinning to the apartheid state. Both held the prevalent formalist style of adjudication to be partly to blame. We could debate as to whether their accounts are fully fair to the accounts of legal positivism developed in the 20th century, because they tend to equate formalism and positivism, not so much David Dysonhaus, but nevertheless. Um, And they don't spend a lot of time thinking of the more enriched thought about legal positivism, which emerged particularly from the work of HLA Hart and Joseph Raz, 
But any reading of the South African jurisprudence would leave little doubt that many South African judges were more than relieved to be able to focus only on the text of statutory provisions and avoid any focus on their context or moral significance. Lawyers who practiced before the courts, especially those who appeared on behalf of anti-apartheid activists or black communities facing the brunt of apartheid laws, racial spatial planning, etc., all too regularly encountered judges who were willing to lift their, were, who were unwilling to they lift their eyes from the statutory text and look beyond to the context and effect of the law. Only a handful of judges regularly acted to limit the oppressive reach of apartheid legislation. And yet it is an important part of the historical record that there were such judges, and practicing lawyers prayed that they would be the judges they would draw for their cases. And throughout their period, important cases were won in which legislation was interpreted in a way to protect rights. The possibility of law being just never was entirely extinguished. Both Arthur Jus Chaskelson, the former Chief Justice who I've mentioned already, and Sidney Kentridge, the distinguished barrister, the two eminent South Africans who have previously delivered this lecture in honor of Sir David Williams, were legal practitioners who spent significant portions of their life representing clients who were opponents of the National Party government or people who had been grievously affected by the operation of apartheid laws. Both were colleagues of mine on the first bench of the Constitutional Court, and many other members of the court had similar professional experience as Arthur and Sidney had had. This experience of the court, of the newly appointed judges um, who had served as legal representatives before courts during apartheid, undoubtedly had an influence on the development of the craft of South African constitutional adjudication in the early years of the democratic dispensation. The development of that craft did not involve a wholesale rejection of what had gone before. As Justice Muhammad said in one of the first judgments delivered by the court, the constitution retains from the past only what is defensible. For the rest, it constitutes a ringing rejection of that part of the past which is disgracefully racist, authoritarian, insular, and repressive. The study of the jurisprudence of South Africa's constitutional court in the recent comparative survey by Jakob Diev and Itzikovic, which I mentioned earlier, suggests that the court employs a very wide array of reasoning styles. Purpose of reasoning in 39 out of the 40 cases studies, reliance on precedent in all 40 cases, on foreign law in 33 out of the 40 cases, on scholarly work in 35 out of the 40 judgments, analogical reasoning, and on social and political history. There is also extensive reliance on key concepts, such as the rule of law in, 27, sorry, in 17 cases, democracy in 27, equality in 30 cases, and human <coughs> dignity in 18. It is noteworthy and perhaps not surprising that the South African court refers to equality and human dignity more frequently than any other court in the study. It is also interesting that together with the German Constitutional Court and the European Court of Human Rights, the South African Court is the court that most embraces a wide array of arguments and key concepts. The study clusters courts into two different groups on the basis of their similarities on the parameter studies, which, as I mentioned, includes argumentation structure, reliance on precedent, etc., it's perhaps surprising that the two clusters do not run strictly on civil and common law lines. The first cluster does include most civil law courts, the European Court of Justice, Taiwan, and interestingly, Ireland, whereas the second includes mixed and common law courts, but also, which would include both South Africa and the United Kingdom, but also Germany and Brazil. The strongest correlation within the first cluster is the relatively narrow array of forms of legal argument and the dominance of one-line conclusive reasoning, quite often accompanied by the prohibition of dissent. The second cluster is more Catholic in its approach to reasoning and strongly correlates with reference to scholarly materials, reliance on precedent, both domestic and foreign, and purpose of forms of reasoning. It would indeed be interesting to see a similar study of the methods of reasoning in the cases of the apartheid era. My hypothesis would be that there would be far less reliance on purpose of reasoning, on foreign law, and the jurisdictions would differ, on scholarly work, on social and political history, and on the key concepts of the rule of law, democracy, equality, and human dignity 
I would suggest, therefore, there's been an enormous change in the craft and style of judicial reasoning in South Africa. The significant, this significant change in the style of judicial reasoning to the dem democratic era was not without contestation, both within the court, between the court and other courts, between the courts and the and profession, and within the legal academy. An illuminating example of this conflict arose in one of the first really jurisprudentially hard cases the court heard, in which there was a conflict between a plain reading of the Constitution and a purposive approach to the interpretation of the provision. The provision stated in brief form that proceedings which had commenced before the commencement of the Constitution would, not, would be dealt with as if the Constitution had not been passed. That meant that the fundamental rights in the Constitution would not be attached to proceedings that had commenced before. The case concerned a confession, and under apartheid law, there was a provision that if a confession was reduced to writing before a magistrate, it would be presumptuously free and voluntary, and it would be very difficult to have it excluded. It had been one of the most abhorred pieces of legislation because so many people were convicted on the basis of such confessions. And so the court had to decide what interpretation are we going to give to this provision. The court split 7-4, uh, if I remember rightly. The majority holding that the provision should be not be read literally, given the importance of such a reading, would be to de de deprive an accused of recourse to the Bill of Rights and potentially to reliance on an unsafe confession in the democratic era, while the min minority held that the literal reading of this section should be accepted. One can see the arguments on both sides. I could at the time. The case gave rise to a very lively academic debate. A sense of the deep contestation can be gained from the two leading articles that were written. The first was called The Longest Erratum Note in History, and the second was, please, sir, may we have some more literalism? <laughs> it's not surprising that a change in the style of judicial reasoning will occasion disagreement amongst judges, practitioners, and scholars. Llewellyn's work makes that plain. It's also not surprising that fundamental constitutional court change may result in such a change in judicial reasoning. The real craft of constitutional adjudication, however, is to seek to ensure that that change is accepted as legitimate, not only amongst judges, but also amongst practitioners and scholars, or at least the majority of them. I was struck when preparing for this lecture by what Sir Sidney Kentridge, Sir Sidney Kentridge said in his lecture about the UK Appellate Court, a Committee of the House of Lords, as it then was in 2003, if I remember rightly. On the whole, he said, the practicing profession is well satisfied with the work of the law lords. Now, and at least for many years past, the Appellate Committee has been intellectually impressive, impartial, fair-minded, and I believe open-minded. To come to a conclusion then, there are deep insights to be gained from Llewellyn's study of appellate decision-making in the U.S. in the mid-20th century. It enables us to acknowledge the close-knit relationship between the different branches of the legal profession, judges, practitioners, and scholars. In the eyes of practicing lawyers and scholars, the legitimacy of the courts is enhanced when they decide cases consistent with their craft in a manner that appears plausible to practitioners. And the correlative is also true. When courts reach implausible decisions or give reasons for their decisions that lack legal cogency, practitioners may become frustrated, not only because of the outcome of the decision, but because in giving such decisions, courts undermine the integrity of the work that practitioners do. The expansion of a court's constitutional jurisdiction in the manner that we have seen in so many parts of the world in the last 75 years may well destabilize the relationships between the bench, bar, and academy, as that expansion calls for different ways of judging and giving reasons. We should not be surprised, then, if we encounter disruption in the relationship between the branches of the profession. The challenge for courts is to develop a new approach to judicial craft and reasoning in a manner, as I've said, that carries the confidence of practitioners. And, of course, by ensuring that the quality of legal argument before courts is excellent, and by proffering careful and insightful academic commentary, practitioners and scholars assist courts to meet this challenge. 
Thinking about the craft of adjudication in this way makes us realize how closely knit the roles of judges, practitioners, and scholars are. A well-functioning legal system will often be found where one finds not only a competent and impartial judiciary, but also a proficient and diligent profession and an engaged and critical academy. Looking back on the Sir George Williams lectures over the last quarter of a century provides a paradigmatic expression of scholars, practitioners, and judges who understand the importance of their craft to the rule of law, recognize that they're engaged on the same overall project from different angles, and who know that for the project to flourish, they must perform their work diligently and thoughtfully and with a close eye on the work of the others. Although I did not know Sir George, alas, I think he would have been delighted to see through these lectures in his honor how the craft of lawyers continues to engage and absorb the talents of so many across the globe. Thank you.